You know, Murph, you know what I'm going to do for this one? We're going to do the intro with the Narcos music that we use for other stuff. You know why we're going to do that? We've got a special guest on today. Well, no, thank you very much. You know, no, 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 no. It's not about me. It's about our actual guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. It's not about you. <laughs> not about me. Wait, hey, look, man, this this is all about you, baby. Tee this thing up for us. All right. So we've been we've been teasing you guys for quite some time now. We we did this interview a couple months ago. We've been holding it for special time and and a brand new year. We feel like this is the right place to start it. So if you've seen the Narco series, of course they didn't let Javier and I play ourselves because uh, we would have really botched it up, and nobody really would have watched it. But the person that that played Javier was Murph. Pedro. It just would have been twenty hours a day of paperwork. You know? Oh, geez, I know. If people knew the truth. <laughs> <laughs> we cop if we didn't have to do paperwork, we could have caught Pablo in like a month. Oh, geez, isn't that the truth? That's you know. At one point, we talked about changing it from the Drug Enforcement Administration to the Drug Administration Administration because of all the paperwork. But today's guest is uh, the actor Boyd Holbrook that played Murphy in uh, Narcos. Uh, really excited to get this on here. This is something we've worked on for well over a year. But uh, getting on his schedule and catching him at home when we could take a couple hours of his time. But uh, finally got him here, so just real honored to have Boyd on. I think you guys will be surprised by some of the things you hear from him. Um, but I'm excited. I'm real excited about this. He's one. a hoot. Now, one of the reasons we held on to this, and you'll hear um, a little bit in there, the time we recorded this, the actor strike was in full force. Mm-hmm. So we were concerned, you know, and I don't think he was, but we didn't want to put him in a bad position. You know, he couldn't, they weren't allowed to promote anything. He couldn't promote his movie, Dial of Destiny. He could talk about what he was doing with Samuel L. Jackson because that was an independent. That was one of the things not covered under the mm-hmm. strike. But we wanted to wait till things were just like fully resolved. And we said, hey, yeah, you know what? Let's kick off the new year with an interview. And you know what? The uh, Some of you know that uh, Javier and I, we got a last-minute invitation to go to, to Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and speak at the International Book Fair over there. And at one point, it looked like Boyd was going to join us, which would have been really exciting because I haven't seen him. Gosh, I haven't seen him in years now. I mean, we stay in touch on the phone and texting and um, different ways like that. But uh, it, was, it just would have really been exciting to be over there with him and hanging out. But uh, last minute, he's, the movie he's working now with Samuel L. Jackson, if the, you know, now that the strike's over, they had to go back to work. And, and I think that probably trumped him joining us over there. But he sent you and I a picture. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> what people will do to, to, uh, to get into that role, he has really sacrificed. And I mean, it's just – it's shocking. It's real shocking. Well, it's the same thing you'll hear him talk about in the episode about what he did to get this role. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to dive into it. He really wanted this role. But you know what? So we've kind of teed it up. We normally we tell you who we brought on at the at the you know at the last before we get get into the episode, but we wanted to do that right up front because we wanted anybody who's listening for the first time to hear, hey, we got a real, you know, movie star on here. Mm-hmm. A guy who's just super nice, humble, kind. Um, I worked with him the day before, before we got on, because he had just gotten a bunch of podcast equipment and he had a bunch of wires. So we figured it out. We yeah. got him up and running <laughs> while he <laughs> was in the middle challenge. of tearing up his house. Oh, my gosh. I hope he got it finished before Mama got home. Oh, boy. And I'll tell you, hey, but God bless him. You're going to hear about his background. How was he able to do that? Well, that's part of his background. But Murph, hey, let's 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 so let's put a pin in that. We're going to get into the episode in just a little bit, but first, guys, we've got to run through our housekeeping here real mm-hmm. quick. Head on over to Apple, Spotify, hit those five stars, let people know what you think of this. Let them know what you think of this episode. I, I know you are going to enjoy this. There's just absolutely no doubt. So go on over there, hit those five stars, let us know what you think about the episode. Also, head on over to the website, gameofcrimespodcast.com. Some pictures that you will not see anywhere else other that than- never been released. Never been released of Boyd and Pedro in training- in training for the movie. And Murph, I don't know, if is one of those pictures the infamous house? Uh, I don't know if I sent you one of those or not. I've got I've, – I, I want the picture of the, him with that look on his face where it's like, oh, shit. Oh, no, I don't have that. I, oh, he was uh, – at one point, they were learning how to raid houses. And so they had to suit up in their, you know, bulletproof vest and their web gear and all that stuff. Oh no, no, no. I was thinking of the other one. And, well, we don't want to give it away. Uh, I'm talking yeah. about the 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 um, – the, instructions that you do not violate. So that one. Okay. Yeah, no, we don't have that. 
Oh, don't, I don't have okay. that one. All right. Well, look, you're going to see pictures you've never seen before. So head on over there. Also, follow us on that thing they call social media at Game of Crimes on Twitter, Game of Crimes podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. But look, folks, hey, man, go and join us. In fact, join us at patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. The first Patreon uh, series we put out were 12 episodes going in depth on narcos from Murphy and JP stuff. You will not hear from anywhere else. In mm-hmm. fact, we, we learned stuff as we went through this and this is the most in depth interview ever given about the series, the book, you know, and the real capture of Pablo. So head on over there. Plus we got season three with Chris Feistel and Dave Mitchell when they took down the Cali cartel. So that was 16 episodes and you got to listen to the end of episode 12 because Chris has taken one for the team. <laughs> he was ready to, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I maybe maybe they did, and they just didn't say anything. We don't know. We don't. We we're not going to speculate. But the sacrifices that you're willing to make, sacrifices, and and guys, we we put out stuff like nine one one. What's your emergency? We had some real dumbass ones this last time. We did some funny <laughs> ones. And if you ever want to know if people are serious about their chicken McNuggets, you just oh, got to listen to the call. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to the call. All right. So head on over there. Plus, we got our Q&A coming up, uh, the Narcometer. Uh, Murphy has redeemed himself. So I think you are now off a of double secret and off a of secret probation, just simply on probation. Yeah. Not, this one, this will get me off completely. This one will okay. I'll be in well, the clear, everybody. I'll be free. Be the, I'll be free at last. I'll be free at last. Free at last. All right. So, and do that, folks. And also, hey, and uh, just remember, folks, this is a show about crime. We talk about bad people doing bad things and bad people doing bad things to good people. We take this story seriously, but... You folks know we don't take ourselves serious at all. We're here to have some fun. We tell serious stories. We bring on some serious guests, but but we're going to be the idiots here. Yeah, and one of the ways we have fun, you got head on over to our Game of Crimes fan page run by our favorite mafia queen, Sandy Salvato, rules with the iron fist with the velvet glove. Just go over to Game of Crimes or go to Facebook and type in Game of Crimes fans. Just answer a couple questions, get admittance into the inner sanctum so that you engage in the hilarity, jocularity that ensues any time that we put out an episode. It's th- th- those people are a hoot. I mean, you got you just got to check it out. Go check it out. It's it's uh, not only do they put funny stories on there, they give us I- ideas on who we can bring on the show. But we you know what when people are having a little bit of an issue, they, these guys got each other's backs. They come to bat for each other. I love that. I love that fan club. Yes, they do. And you know what else? We get a lot of our stories for like the next segment coming up because we put them into this little thing. You know what time it is, Murph? I know you know what time it is. Guess what time it is? What time is it? It's time, it's time for, for Small Town Holy Spotter. You know, we should. I'm going to have to do the intro with the uh, narco. We're going to do the narcos music instead of our usual police yeah. siren on this one. You know why? Because all of these stories have a Kentucky nexus to them. There you go. So, And who's from Kentucky? You are. Boyd Holbrook. No, he's not. Yeah, he is. I'm just kidding. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Tennessee and West Virginia. Yeah, but you got y'all got family down there, and we'll, we'll talk about the uh, Hatfield and the McCoys in the episode. But hey, guys, guess what, Murph? Yeah. Um, Kentucky State Police received a call Tuesday morning reported that an intoxicated man was operating their definition of a motor vehicle in the town of Betsy Lane, population 688. Salute. Salute. <laughs> The investigators made contact with the suspect, Michael Kimmel, no relation to Jimmy Kimmel, uh, but he fled on foot. Pled on <laughs> fled, He did what? Fled, fled. He fled on foot. And you know what he left behind? He left behind his ride. And you know what his ride was? Oh, I, I don't even want to venture a guess. It was a horse. He left <laughs> behind a horse, which makes perfect sense since he was eventually corralled and charged with DUI. Um, you know what his alias is? His what? alias is Mike Bicycle. You know why they call him Mike Bicycle? Because he's had his license probably revoked 50 times and can't drive anything but a bike. Uh, I'm trying to find out where this place is, but it's so remote. I, <laughs> I can't even find it on the Betsy Google Lane, Maps. L-A-Y-N-E. Betsy Lane. All right. Hey, Murph. You know who George Howard is? George Howard. I don't think so. I uh, know. It doesn't matter because he's the subject of our next story. So he okay. was arrested early in the morning after police spotted his 2006 Ford swerving across the road into Louisville. Not Louisville, people. Louisville. Mm-hmm. Louisville suburb. Mm-hmm. At one point, the vehicle collided with the curb, almost causing an accident. When it did, a head popped up out of his lap. Cops say Howard, 59, was having difficulty controlling the auto because he was he hit the trifecta, folks. He was driving, drinking a beer, and getting oral sex from his 53-year-old female passenger. Oh, God. 
And when they approached, they said, what are you doing? She says, we were just talking. And the officer says, allegedly, hey, next time, don't speak so close to the microphone. <laughs> Boop, boop, boom, boom. I've been waiting to use that one. Oh, <laughs> oh. oh. And, how, and how is it that we know how to say Louisville? Our first guest of last year, yep. of 2023, was John Mattingling. And the real story of Brianna Taylor. So you got to go listen to that one. So Murph, uh, it's going to shock you. Uh, you know, the legal limit's 0.08. Mm-hmm. He was twice the legal limit. So he went to jail. I wonder how old he was. Uh, he's 59. Oh, She's okay. 53. And But uh, Howard's companion, who was not arrested, tried to hide a beer under her dress as the police approached. So when Howard exited the car, his pants fell to the ground. <laughs> and what fell out of her dress? A beer. A bear. It's <laughs> <laughs> better than something else. All right. Now, her, Murph, this next one, though. If you want, you type in Florida man, you got to type in Kentucky man. You're going to get stories like this. So a Kentucky man was arrested Tuesday after police said he drunkenly found a way into a stranger's apartment. Now, this happened at 1.45, 1.45 p.m. in the afternoon. This isn't like 1.45 a.m., 1.45 p.m. Okay. In Elizabethtown, Elizabethtown population 3, 000, or 31,938. Salute. Salute. He entered the residence on Rabina Court sat down on a couch where a woman was sleeping, uh, moved the woman's feet so he could sit down, and when she woke up, he told her, I'm armed and horny. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's something you don't hear every day. (laughs) You know, I've heard of armed and dangerous. I have never put out a bolo for somebody who is armed and horny. Well, what was he armed with? Was it a single shot or a snub nose revolver? Apparently, apparently it was a two inch uh, <laughs> single shot flesh repeater. <laughs> oh, did she laugh? <laughs> well, the case was thrown out of court, lack of evidence. So, uh, <laughs> no, I take it back. The evidence wouldn't stand up in court. Oh, oh Lord, these are getting, it's getting worse. anyway. It's getting worse. This is going to shock you. He was drunk. He smelled strongly of alcohol, slurred his speech, and was very unsteady on his speech. Feet. When they interviewed him. He said he knew the woman was unable to tell the officer her name. At one point, he said, I kept trying to get her name, but she wouldn't give it to me. (laughs) (laughs) Good grief. (laughs) Uh, She wasn't in that car earlier, was she? I don't think so. No, no, no. (laughs) This guy, I'm armed and horny. All right, well, look, we've already teed uh, this up. So the best thing we can do now as we close out Small Town Police Botter, so all these stories were Kentucky in honor of our guest, Boyd Holbrook, actor extraordinaire, yeah. played Murph extraordinaire. So, Murph, what do you say? You ready to get into it and play the biggest, baddest, most dangerous game of all, the Boyd Holbrook Special Edition Game of Crimes? Hey, everybody, I am so honored to have Boyd Holbrook on here. This is, this is a, a true gift that he's given to us. So get in, sit down, shut up, and hold on. Come on, boy, tell us the true stories now. Well, amigos, amigas, players, playerettes, do do dudettes, everybody in between, this is a momentous occasion. This has been a long journey. We have had to employ the U.S. Marshals, trackers, SEAL Team 6, to track this dude down. And Murph, I'm, I'm going to let you talk about it. I'm going to let you do the intro because I feel sorry for the guy. His house has been totally torn apart. He's out of work, no unemployment checks. I think we need to start a GoFundMe page for him. Well, you know what I ended up doing? I had to call his mom. He made the mistake of introducing me to his mom a few years ago in California. And, and uh, when all else fails, call mom. <laughs> she will tune you up. Now, this is... Uh, I can't tell you how excited I am. And, and I'm not doing it just because this young man is here on the screen with us as we're doing an interview today, but just honored as to what has transpired uh, from the Escobar investigation. The last thing we ever thought would happen in our lives was that there would be a show depicting the takedown of Pablo Escobar. And I was fortunate enough to meet an actor who, uh, as it turns out, you know, I think we've got some familial lines going back because of where he's from and where I grew up. But uh, it is a true honor to welcome the actor, the famous, the infamous Boyd Holbrook <laughs> onto today's show, man. Boyd, welcome, brother. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Thank you very much. What a nice introduction. And, and you <laughs> can tell like he's, got his, he's, doing his, already. he's doing his sexy voice much. today, so... Uh, I'm, I'm up close and personal to this <laughs> microphone. Hey, well, we did start a GoFundMe page, Bucks for Boyd. So if you guys want yeah. to just go there and help out, um, you know, we, we found out yesterday, no, 
no unemployment checks. I mean, you're, you're out of work, right? It's hard life. I am currently out of work, but I am staying the course. Um, yeah, my organization is on the picket line right now, but, um, yeah, you kind of have to keep prepping. I, I got, um, some films have been, you know, moved around and stuff like that. And so, uh, I think I'll, we might get a waiver to shoot. So, uh, we'll shoot maybe in November. Yeah. Because we're not like a, it's an independent film, so it's uh, not a studio thing. So some of these films can get waivers and, um, I'm sure am hoping we get that waiver because, um, I started prepping for this job out in, in March. Um, it's a film, uh, called last meals, um, with Samuel Jackson, where I play, um, a prisoner on a hunger strike. So, um, yeah, I'm, we're on the picket line, but, uh, it doesn't really, doesn't really, I can't really stop prepping what I'm doing right now. Cause well, I'm you're on, on a, a hunger strike technically, right? I'm, I'm technically on a self-induced hunger strike. How <laughs> bizarre and, and, um, back ass act backwards that may be. Um, yeah, but you know, I can't really, well, you can't balloon back up and have to do it all over again. Yeah. So it's, it, we started this thing in March. It was, we we're supposed to shoot in May and it just got pushed. And then with the strike, it's been pushed further. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, mentally, uh, pretty, pretty challenging. <laughs> well, how do you prepare for something like that? Do you have a, I mean, I, there's always coaches for like voice coach or acting coach. Do you have somebody yep. work with you on, um, you know, cause you got to maintain your energy. Cause dude, you, you got your house torn apart. You got to put that thing back together. Yeah. I, you know, I, I do have, I've got a really good insulated team. I always work with the same, um, same guy rehearsing, uh, Terry Knickerbocker, uh, studied underneath him at school. And then I'll, you know, I'll have uh, voice coaches or, um, um, you know, whatever it may, t- may take to do the job. But, um, right now, yeah, I'm just, uh, trying to do, uh, something. I saw the show alone and that gave me the idea. It's like, okay, if I'm not going to eat, I have to have some crazy, uh, endurance physical job so I can just keep burning calories. And, uh, so I decided to sand my, the floors of my entire house, uh, <laughs> while my wife was gone. So, um, this will be a nice surprise. Hopefully she'll see the floor before the podcast. Well, that was kind of funny because we've, we've scheduled a couple, uh, of interviews with you and you'll send us a picture of what your house looks like. And it's like, Oh my God, it looks like a bomb went off in there. <laughs> yeah. And now it makes sense because mom is going to be home at the end of the month and you got to get that shit straightened out. I got to get it done. I got to get it done. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> hey, well, let's, let's talk, as we do with all of our guests, we always want to start off with Colson Nostra, think of ours. So a lot of them had you get started in law enforcement, but, but you, how did you get started in this thing? Because you come from Prestonburg, Kentucky, by the way, population 3,681. Salute. <laughs> so how'd you get started, man? <laughs> Uh, you know, I saw, I, I used to watch, um, the Russell Simmons death poetry jam when I was a kid. And I, maybe when people say they want to be doctors and they just, I want to be a doctor. I, I just saw these guys perform and, uh, I just, I just, that's, that's what I'm going to do with my life. That's, I want to express that. I want to feel that. I want to, uh, have that charge. Um, and then it took me another 10 years to, uh, to get to New York and to get into school and start training and studying. And, um, but yeah, yeah but you, but you had an opportunity, you got, dis- as they say, you got discovered, right though. So it wasn't, I mean, you were doing carpentry and somebody that you, and you were freaking male model. Uh, yeah, I was, believe it or not. I don't know uh, <laughs> oh, many people that they might believe. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean. It's one of those things. Uh, but yeah, I, I was working at a theater company. I dropped out of college. Um, I met Michael Shannon and he was, um, he was the one actor I'd met and he, uh, recommended I get into the theater. So I got into a theater company. My sister knew a lighting director. So I started building sets and running sound design and, and that's where I really just found my tribe. I was like, Oh, these are the people that I can, that I'm going to, you know, spend my life with. And then, um, yeah, luck, lucky. I don't know if it was luck or not. Cause it was a weird, weird, um, 
job vo- vocation. Uh, but a lady came by and said, Hey, you know, you should, you should do some modeling for these companies. And I didn't even know what it meant at the time. Um, but I said, uh, yeah, sure. You can take my picture. And then a couple months later, uh, this company out of New York called me and said, we got a job for you. And I, again, luck would have it. I had a cousin out in Hoboken and she let me stay on her couch for a month. And I took that money and got an apartment and got a job at the coffee shop in Union Square and just kept crawling and scratching. So, you know, a lot of people when you hear their stories, their origin stories, it's like, I went out to Hollywood. I went to LA. I mean, you're on the exact opposite coast. What kind of opportunities was it just the modeling stuff? Because I know you did some stuff with art. I mean, you've got some stuff you've done with art and sculpting. So what was it about New York that attracted you versus going out to Hollywood? Well, I knew I, I, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I didn't really understand fully what that meant or, or what, you know, angle and what medium I was going to do. Um, you know, I'd been um, in some like talented and gifted classes for drawing as a kid, but, you know, a lot of people are as well. And uh, so I always had that um, fascination and interest. And then um, I got to New York and I got a camera. Um, I started going to art galleries. I saw um, an artist there and I just called him up and I said, you know, hey, I'd love to work for you. And um, he was surprised about that because I basically wanted to work for free. And, um, you know, he taught me mold making. And then um, I ended up getting a, a gallery show about a year later and then getting into a group show. And with, um, I think one of the group shows was me going down and documenting uh, all the coal mining there in Eastern Kentucky. And oh, really? Making some, yeah, doing some photography of one of the miners. And then, um, did your family have a mining background or you have any family in the coal business? Yeah. My, my dad ran a, a D 11 for anybody who knows how big those dozers are on a, um, a surface mine mining operation there in Eastern Kentucky. So Eastern Kentucky used to be America's, uh, energy capital of, uh, America, uh, in the eighties and nineties. And, and it was a great job. And, uh, so I, my dad's done that and he's retired now. You know, Any effects uh, from the coal? Or, I'm sorry, Murph, go ahead. I think we compared notes one time, and, and Connie's family is all coal miners. Her dad and both brothers. And uh, I think her oldest brother was a superintendent at one of the mines there adjacent to where your dad worked. I think they may not have known each other personally, but they knew of each other. Mm-hmm. So it's, uh, you know. Very <laughs> all close this, knit. Yeah, and if this is all leading to an incestuous relationship that, uh, you know, hey, well, we keep me out probably of intersect. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, we do have yeah. some things in common. By the way, actually, you know what? All three of us have things in common. And we'll get into narcos, but you, we've all been in Bogota, Colombia. Mm-hmm. Yep. We've all got a connection to narcos. Mm-hmm. We've all been trained to at least some extent right by DEA, right? And we've all been told not go in the house. <laughs> 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 You know about that story, is that right? Oh, that's that right? Two of us listened. <laughs> that was a setup. <laughs> yeah, that was. I walked right into that one, didn't I? Uh, oh, oh man! But it's nice well, to see yeah. you laugh about it. <laughs> um, I had the the great idea of. Um, I was like, well, if we're going to play these DEA agents, maybe we should just go to Quantico, train for a week or two. Um, I thought that was. I thought that was a great idea at the time. And I got Pedro involved in it and, um, Steve and Javier pulled some strings and I think they were the first civilians to ever go into the DEA and, and, you know, get out there and walk through the actual training. As far as I know, and I, and I'll be honest with you, it would not happen today. It was the reason it happened was because the administrator at the time was Michelle Linhart and she mm-hmm. knew, you know, she knew this is going to be a big time show. We thought, <laughs> we didn't think anybody was going to watch the show. But uh, because right. of her and uh, and uh, Tommy Harrigan, who was the deputy administrator, they made it all happen. Now, had you known Pedro prior to that, or was that your first time working with him? The first time working with him, yeah, first time. We we went out, had dinner together one night, and um, I laid it on him. I said, "Hey, I think I got us into the DEA, man. Want to go?" <laughs> <laughs> I went, in? I, what, did he start shaking then, or what? <laughs> Uh, you know, everything sounds great on paper, you know. <laughs> well, let's let's walk backwards a little bit and, and talk about getting into that because you had you obviously got into acting. You did a few things like the Hatfields and McCoys. Uh, you were Cap Hatfield. Um, I thought it was pretty cool too. Some of the stuff you did, like Logan, 
Um, you know, it's some neat stuff. The Marvel stuff, you know, uh, th- that's such a franchise, you know. Um, but how did this, how does, so walk us through, how does it come about that you are asked, did you know, to read for the part or did you, did you have the fix was in or did you compete against other people? How did this whole thing about narcos end up on your desk? So, um, I had a casting director call me who I'd worked with previously. And, um, she said, I'm casting the show narcos and, um, it's about, um, you know, to take down a Pablo Escobar, you want to go in and meet these guys. And I said, yeah, absolutely. Um, I just finished working on a, um, on a sculpture piece from the, the artist I was working on and he went down to Colombia in Brazil and, um, basically acquired a bunch of Coke and made a cocaine sculpture out of a Colombian farmer. And, uh, we, of coke? <laughs> of yeah, it, yeah, it was uh, more of a, you know, conceptual, um, how do you, you know, eye, eyebrow razor. Um, but as you know, in, in, in correlation to show, you know, what the products come out of there and, and speaking through that, that medium of uh, sculpture. So we'd finished that and we'd, you know, rehear, you know, researched the, the hell out of Columbia. So we'd found out all about, you know, the, the, you know, the drug trafficking there. And then a couple months later, this comes up. And so I get into the meeting and I, I know a lot about Columbia. So we just start talking all about Columbia and I find out that, um, you know, why am I here? They want me to play this guy named Steve Murphy. Well, it's because you both were hillbillies from Kentucky or, you know, That's that area. Right. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> He's a hillbilly and so am I. Wow. I think I might be able to pull that off. There you go. Hey, well, real quickly too, how much did you know though about Pablo Escobar prior to this? Um, Was that part of your research on the statue or how much were you aware of that? You know, um, I, not, not a ton, you know, I mean, um, I knew that he was in, you know, an iconic infamous drug dealer, but, um, didn't really know the extent of, of his background and, and just really the overall international global impact that he had. Um, that wasn't until, you know, you, that's the great thing about being an actor. You get to dive in and, and, you know, be a, you know, a micro anthropologist about all these, um, these things. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's interesting too. Um, cause you know, you know, you hear actors talk about stuff. They talk about expanding their roles. They want to do something different. It's like uh, justified. You kind of played a really weird ass dude. dude. I'm, I'm glad you don't have those crazy eyes for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but was this, was, what was appealing about this other than just the role? Was there something about getting into the law enforcement side or doing, you know, like the narco trafficking side? What was it that really struck a chord with you that says, yeah, this is a role I want to do? Well, it was, um, a two part. Really, I knew that Jose Pagia was um, was going to be directing this, and um, also that this was, you know, this was a really well known story. So it was already going to have a lot of uh, eyeballs on it. And then with the sort of creative direction that Jose was going to do, um, after seeing his movies, this guy's a prolific filmmaker. So, um. You know, I, I felt like I was working above, you know, my pay grade there. I thought I was getting an opportunity, and I, I definitely was. You know, he had, Jose treated Javier and I like kings. He was so nice, so easy to talk to, so supportive. But, man, he pissed off a lot of people in Hollywood. <laughs> well, yeah, he's not, I mean, he's not a guy that's, that's you're going to hire him and tell him what to do. You hire him for his creative vision and, um you know, Narco is a pretty prolific show. It's there's nothing like it. It was especially at the time. Well, he uh, I saw pictures where uh, the staff, so Eric Newman, uh, Jose, some other folks went and met with the president of Colombia. You know, typically, yeah. I mean, when I was in the government, you always had a, you always had a suit on for meetings like that, and uh, and and they went in and I think you know they had like open collared shirts and sport coats, and so did the president. But there was Jose, Jose in a t shirt and a skull cap. <laughs> yeah, he didn't. That's to say. <laughs> he didn't care. Yeah. That wasn't he a big deal to him. So, and tell everybody, give us kind of the inside baseball thing. So, like from the first time you're approached by the casting director till you actually sign a contract, you say, I'm the guy that's in. What does that process look like? How long does it take? And was anybody else competing for the part two or was it, was it you? Yeah, I think there was another uh, slightly 
a couple bigger names, if you, that's how you want to, let's say it, that were sort of, that they were approaching. Um, I think, you know, it's probably a three, three, you know, it's probably six months from when we started, you know, Hey, meet these guys. There is the possibility of shooting the show called Narcos to actually going into production. So maybe six months, uh, to maybe nine months before we actually started, you know, the interviewing auditioning process to, uh, you know, Hey, you got the job. I think that took a couple months. I met with everybody, Eric Newman and Jose and, um, Chris Brancato, who's, who's one of the main writers there. Um, which it really helped me, you know, it helped me that I was from the same area, um, from the same area, um, you know, had similar dialect and, and stuff like that. And I think I'd just done a film called, um, little accidents about, um, a coal miner who had survived a, a cave in and it was regionally, you know, same where, same place where Steve is from. And so, um, that kind of, that definitely leaned into my favor. Nice. Well, the thing that would have cut you from the role, I think, is you had more hair than Murph. I mean, how did they handle that? <laughs> well, Steve, Steve's going to love this part. I, I shaved a receding hairline into my head. <laughs> you can't. Did you really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. I shaved, yeah, oh, that my was the... The, uh, in the off season, that was an interesting look in between <laughs> season one and season two. <laughs> Here's you know, something one of you the, didn't know, Murph. Yeah, this is educational. You know, one yeah. of the other things. I'll do uh, anything for the role, you know. There you go. Well, you're starving yourself right now. Holy cow, that's that's commitment, <laughs> I got to say. Well, part but, of it's because he doesn't have income coming in. So, you know, we got to cut back on the food as well to make the mm. dollar stretch. Yeah. Well, the whole goal is not yeah. eat cat food, right? That's right. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, it's uh, this is it's amazing uh, what you folks are willing to go through. The professionalism associated with your craft there is that's uh, you do things that you know people think we do crazy things. Well, I think you do crazy things, but uh, that's yeah. what makes the world go around, right? Well, I knew that it was just um, I had to give everything or or lay it all on the line, however you want to put it. To um, to you know, I was kind of a no name. Uh, at the time, maybe still am, but, um, Hardly. you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I felt like I needed to, you know, I just was ready to do anything mm -hmm. to, uh, to make that uh, a great project. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a blast. I, you know, it was just for us, it, it's experience of a blast. lifetime. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was the only actor that, that didn't leave. We were there, there for nine months. Um, so you stayed in, you, you stayed in Columbia the whole time? Yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I think, <laughs> The, the producers or showrunners, um, they would, there was two of them and then they would stay for two weeks and then they'd switch out and go back to Los Angeles and come down to Columbia. But, uh, we got to stay the whole time. We got that treat. Well, yeah, and, and think about this, Morgan, here was a challenge because, um, you know, I don't know who the big names you were talking about that you were competing against. I know at one point they mentioned, uh, to us. And I don't know if they were doing this out of courtesy or, or just to mm -hmm. you know, put a smile on our face, whatever they said, uh, you know, they're considering Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, I, I was talking to Chris Brancato at the time and, and, and several weeks went by and I, I went back to Chris and I said, Hey man, you know, I don't, I didn't know who these actors are. I, I don't know actors. And uh, I said, I looked that guy up. He's pretty big. And he's like, yeah, he, uh, his agent turned it down. And I'm like, well, how come? And he said, well, you gotta understand Steve. He said, you know, he gets $5 million to make a movie that's, ten, that's filmed in less than three months. We're asking him to commit to two years to 20 episodes and we can't, we don't have that kind of budget to pay. So yeah. that, but no, I, I mean, that's absolutely the reason why I got the, op one of the opportunities. I mean, there's people and it's like, there's tiers, you know, I say Jake's in that top tier and I'm probably below it, but, um, you know, to uproot your life and to move to, uh, you know, Columbia's incredibly gorgeous culture and, um, a place to, to be, but you know, it's, it's, it's third world in some places and it's, you know, you ain't got internet connection to talk to your family and, uh, it is, you know, it's rough going there for, so it's, it was, um, it was a lot, it was a lot to do. And to someone of, you know, let's say that caliber to, to do it, but uh, that's how people get opportunities, man. People pass on stuff. So how did, you know, because Pedro Pascal just came out of, you know, um, he was in uh, Game of Thrones, you know, 
he's got a you know huge name. How did what was the pull between you think him getting into that role? Because you know he obviously had a, a big name at that time. He was well known. Um, but you know, but to get two of you guys of your even your caliber to commit to nine months, there had to be something. Just it, it, obviously, it's not just the pay. It's like, but the excitement of being down there and being a you know in a sense a part of history. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think Pedro just, yeah, like you said, come off the Game of Thrones. So he had that little, um, you know, push. But I think John Ortiz was was the name that they were floating around. And, um, you know, I, 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 I don't know how, how he weaseled his way in there, but he sure did. And um, we, you know, we were like a little pack of brothers after, you know, a couple months of shooting. Well, now tell us about you. T- you said you had to be interviewed, and then you audition. What is that like when you're going in for something like this? Who does the interview? Who does the audition? What did you have to do to prepare for that? The, the reason I'm fascinated by this, I think other people do. They just sit down, they turn on Netflix, uh, they watch Narcos, and they go, "Oh, there's Boyd, there's Pedro." You know, we see the story without realizing for that 45 minutes or whatever it is, how much work goes into it beforehand. So what, what's the intro and audition like for somebody like you? Because at this point in time, you've got about, what, a good 10 years into the business now? Um, yeah, I think I was 32 when we were 31 when we started shooting. And I, I got out of drama school when I was 28. So um, I really started working when I was like, you know, 29, 30, I started booking a couple of films and this and that. Um, so, you know, I wasn't, I was, you know, still kind of a, still kind of a, still fresh, but, um, you know, you, you meet with these guys, they want to see if, you know, they just probably poking the bear a little bit. Is this guy confident enough to be able to handle this? Um, what's, you know, they're asking you all kinds of questions. Maybe what, to see what your lifestyle is like, um, how dedicated you are, um, you know, just kind of getting a vibe because you, you are going to be in the trenches with these people for two years. And, um, did you know at the time it was going to be two seasons? I, I, well, it was going to be, I heard two to three. Um, and I negotiated a two year contract, um, because of, you know, when me and, um, Wagner, Mora, both, um, you know, had the same contract because I didn't really, I wanted to play it as the, as Steve did. You know, he, he was down there for the amount of time he was down there. And then once Pablo was taken care of, uh, he got back to your life. And I think, you know, in reality, Javier did, you know, maybe kind of transition out a little bit more and that's kind of how they played it with Pedro a little bit too. So, um, yeah, we kind of stayed, stayed to script on that. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, um, well, what we say is that the timeline is pretty accurate. Um, and, and what you see in seasons one and two, uh, about a third of it's true. Third of it's kind of true. And third of it's is, man, that's came right out of the Hollywood writer's room. (laughs) 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 And which there were fantastic writers on the show. I loved them all. They were all so nice to us. Well, we do a Patreon channel, and so for the last two, what we call our Narcometer, we do the Narcometer review, rate things on a scale of 1 to 10 kilos for accuracy, authenticity, and believability. We did seasons one and two of Narcos right before, yeah. in, in honor of you finally coming on after 18 months, we had to track you down. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Call mom. <laughs> call mom. <laughs> Actually, it was Jonathan Bernthal. <laughs> we sent him, yeah. He sent you the middle finger from our <laughs> gang conference in Southern yeah. California. <laughs> Yeah, he's he's, he's a good guy. That John's great. <laughs> hey, so let's let's get into it. You, when you finally get notice of it, how do you how do you now start preparing for the role of Steve Murphy? Because at some point you got to meet the guys. Um, you know, you got to start understanding DEA and tactics. So how does that work out? Well, I'm just trying to figure out what's the theme of the character, um, and um, from you know the theme of the character is is kind of a fish out of water. You know, you've got this gringo down there who's, um, doesn't really speak the language. Uh, you know, it's part of his, his, his journey is, you know, uh, learning that, um, you know, engulfing himself in the, in the, in the culture, adopting to, to children, you know, it's, it's pretty deep. Um, so looking at it from that angle, so the guy's not, um, He's a fish out of water. He's he's navigating this really unfamiliar land that he's trying to work through. And then there's the the physicalization of the character that I always like to start with. Um, 
you know, I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, so I've got a pretty, pretty twangy accent. Um, but at the, you know, beginning of my career, I understood that, you know, I, I'm only going to be able to play a handful of characters here. So I got into voice and speech and now I can do, you know, Australian, Brooklyn, let's know, hear Australian. Appalachia. Let's hear, let's hear. Uh, if uh, I was from Wagga Wagga. Wagga Wagga. That's right, mate. G'day. G'day. <laughs> Pretty good, man. Um, yeah. Give me a script and um, I can turn it into something. But um, so I, I, I usually start with where the character's from. So, um, you know, that dialect was easy for me and uh, the voiceover is a very big component to, uh, to that. So just figuring out um, the voice of the character and then, then I need to know, okay, well, what's, how can I, I'm never going to have the, the amount of training that Steve Murphy's had. But I need to do something to give me the illusion of confidence that, um, you know, I've, I've, I've dabbled in it at least rather than being a com complete unknown. And, and that's where it comes in. I call up Steve with the big idea saying, uh, Hey, maybe is it possible to get into Quantico? Um, what did you think Murph, when you D? heard that the first time going, this civilian wants to get into that an actor wants to get into Quantico. Well, you know, I mean, the first of all, that an actor's calling you somebody that's, you know, it's a true Hollywood actors like, shit, I don't know any of these people, but it was, uh, <laughs> it was a fantastic idea, you know? And, and that's when I reached out to Javier, ran it by him. He's good with it. Uh, talked to, I think I called probably Eric next, who's the Eric Newman is creator of the Narco series. He's the executive producer. And uh, he was all in favor of it. And I'm like, well, you know, you got to get somebody to pay for it, Eric. And he's like, I'll take care of you. You take care of DEA. I'll take care of the money. And uh, we ended up talking to, I think, and originally to Tommy Harrigan, who was deputy administrator. And he took it to Michelle, who was administrator. And it was no time until the approval came down. And it was more so than what we thought it was going to be. They said, you know, they said, what is it you want to do? And we said, well, you know, we'd like to bring them to headquarters and uh, let them get some briefings from some of the old Intel analysts that are still in the job and get that perspective. And we'll talk to them. And uh, then we'd like to take them to the DEA Academy. And, and uh, that led to being embedded with an ongoing DEA Academy class for a week, <laughs> which, uh, you know, that was pretty cool. Oh, it was incredible. It was fantastic. It was, it was amazing. Talk about going into that. What were you thinking? What did you, you know, what was your paradigm shift? What did you think it was from watching TV versus what did you discover from reality that changed how you're going to do the role? Well, you, you kind of have this naive bliss that this is just going to be great and fun and uh, an experience. Um, but we got into it. We met up with Javier and, and Steve down in, um, in uh, Virginia there. And, uh, we, you know, got clearance, got name tags and we go through the gates and it's a 30,000 acre complex or something like that. So it's, it's enormous. I mean, there's, there's, well, I was just initially, you know, taken back by these little ghost towns that they've created where they can do all these, um, you know, these exercises at where there's, you know, cars where you can, they taught us how to run a car off the road, um, and uh, they've got motel rooms where you can do uh, buys and deals with them. And, um, and houses. And that's, that's, where, that's where it gets, <laughs> that's where it started to change, get a little interesting. And <laughs> they took us to uh, some houses and, and some deals. And they have all these um, scenarios and, and um, uh, I guess, uh, instructions of what to do and what not to do. And how so we're, and we're in Hogan's Alley is where we are. We're in Hogan's Alley. And the first one, we were in a, first one, we were in a, um, a hotel room and they, they, they want you to, um, to, to, to buy a half a kilo of something, uh, the, of the booger sugar, as people call it, cowboy dust. And, um, we pull up, you, you know, you're in a car, you're, you're with another agent, you pull up to this, um, you know, makeshift apartment, uh, roadside motel looking thing and go inside and the guy's there. And I'm like, this is great, man. I is just like a little improv class. I can do this. I can, I can bullshit with the best of them. And that went pretty well. So that gave me a fair amount of confidence. And then, um, uh, Pedro does the same and, you know, we're, you know, comparing notes and did you get it? Yeah, I bought it. Yeah, I did that. 
and then they want us to, to, to take us to another operation. And they give you this uh, piece of paper that says, um, it says, whatever you do, uh, I thought it said, don't leave. And um, they go, <laughs> pull up to the house. Guy meets me at the door immediately. Uh, hey, how you doing? Yeah. Hey, you want to come in? Sure. I love to come in. First mistake. <laughs> Get inside the house. And, <laughs> and the guy's like, so remind me where I know you. I was like, oh, we met through Tammy. And Tammy, I was like, oh, man, I'm going to have to start spitballing here. Um, yeah, Tammy's, uh, yeah, we met her at the strip club and just hanging out. And then this other third person comes through the back bedroom. And it took me off guard immediately. He had to come in with a little bit of little fire in his belly. He had a big attitude, me, man. <laughs> Yeah, big attitude. Who's this guy? Why'd you let this guy in the house? I was like, take it easy, man. We're just trying to, we're just playing make believe here, buddy. Just take it easy. <laughs> and um, he goes, stand up. And before they go in, they give you this, this, uh, this, you know, it's a, it's a basically, a, uh, you know, a, a dry fired gun. It makes, you know, without bullets, it's blanks. And, uh, he asked me to stand up and turn around and he pulls that gun out of the back of my waistband. And things then got real serious. Um, and you know, I know that there's DEA in the, in the background kind of observing all this happening, but I, I'm starting to actually kind of fear for my life here. And, um, I'm like, is this joking? Are we serious here guys? And he tells me to shut up and he's screaming at me, sit the, F down and this and that. And I'm like, gosh. <laughs> and then he goes around me with my gun. He's taken off me and uh, fires it off beside my head. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, um, operation's over. You've, uh, you've now been killed. And uh, it happened, you know, in less than a minute. Um, that's how serious it, it got. What and, did you think uh, of their acting job? Uh, a master class, Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> um, I was, you know, it was, it got, uh, got serious real quick. And I uh, come to find out that I wasn't even supposed to go in the house, not to leave the house, but don't go in. Um, cause Pe Pedro, he, um, he nailed that one. He never, they he kept, <laughs> kept kind of coercing him to come in, come on in. I was talking about this. No, no, not going to do that. And, um, but that was, uh, that was a rude awakening to, uh, just how serious this job can, can get. Very quickly. And that's, and, and that's what every trainee goes through. You know, that, that wasn't scripted just specifically for you and Pedro. It's, it's to teach the guys, you can walk away from a deal. You know, there's, there's none of these shit birds and there's no amount of dope worth any good guy getting injured over. But I mean, you handled it professionally. I, I got to say, man, you kind of fell out on the floor there when he fired that gun, and, and I'm thinking, oh no, did he crap his pants? Is he okay? Do you have a heart attack? And, you know, and they called uh, they called administrative stop, is what they call mm -hmm. it. And uh, and I mean, you you didn't let on that you were nervous. This I'm I'm kind of surprised that you were nervous because uh, I didn't see that in you at all that day. I think you were surprised. You were shocked as at the way it went. But um, I yeah, I just didn't know how you know. It just, it was, uh, shocking how fast it went, it, it went down, you know, one, one little move and, uh, you're outnumbered and you're in their house and, um, you're in trouble. Yeah. They, you know, Morgan, they even made these guys sit through a, a one hour classroom session. I thought, man, we even went and sat in that and I thought this is still as boring now as it was when I went through the academy back in 87. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, they had all kinds of stuff. We went to, I remember going to like an Applebee's and they had these hot, these actors they hired out of Maryland. They had this one lady who was f fantastic, but they would wire all these, you know, these young kids up who were training to be DEA. And we would, um, go out to this parking lot and they'd meet up with these actors who were playing dealers and stuff like that. And, uh, so we would, we were sitting in cars, you know, parked just like they would do surveillance, you know, a couple parking lots, parking spaces away, watching all of it kind of go down, but you could hear it because they were mic'd up. You could just, for, I guess, for studying purposes, but, oh man, I mean, you have, this is a job that you kind of have to fail at in training to, to, to be able to save your life later on. 
And I just remember one of these ladies just chewing this kid up, you know, <laughs> just like, at, you know, kind of cross-referencing how they knew each other, or, you know, his, how ballot or, uh, how legit he was. And she just tore him to pieces. Yeah. They're checking your backstop to see if you've yeah. got the story oh, yeah. or you just, are yeah. you winging it? You know, which unfortunately, where are you from? More often. <laughs> I'm, I'll never forget it. She said, where are you, where, where you, where you live at? She's like, I live over here. What street? Elm street, Elm street. You live on Elm street. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell me but, about the store there on the corner of Maine and Elm. What's the name of it? You know, you know, <laughs> and yeah, that's you're right. You go down. It, well, let me ask you just that one little incident in the house. Yeah, we kind of did set you up, but but you hit upon a very key point because we get a lot of law enforcement people uh, listening, and it's a lot about training. But how did that one little thing of getting surprised like that help you now when you start doing this role of being Steve Murphy? You know, actually now you're in Columbia. You know, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it's almost it's like, dude. I mean, this is real shit when you're down there, even though you know it's acting, but it's like. But in your role, you know that tens of thousands of people have been killed by Pablo. I mean, people are dying down there. Cops are getting shot. And now you're in this same country now. Well, I mean, it was, it, it measures you. It makes you, it, that one situation, um, it woke my ass up. It, um, it really informed me that, you know, I'm dealing with dangerous people all the time. And whatever you say can be used against you or not. You know, you've got to float that line of how, you know, um, an agent, uh, how he walks that tightrope of just what to say, what to do in the right situation. You know, a lot of people kept telling me, oh, you need a bodyguard when you get down to Columbia. Um, you know, you're out in these um, favelas or um, uh, communas, as they call them down there. And you, it just, Going, I mean, I know it was one week, it was, you know, intensive week, but it, it, it was so much, um, I took so much from it rather than never doing it that, um, you know, it just kind of m makes your eyes peeled of, of who you're dealing with, when you're dealing with them and, and how measured you, you should be because, um, you know, your life is on the line in, in a certain way. Had you not gone through that week of training, how much different do you think the show would have been, at least for you portraying Murphy, had you not been able to do that week of training? I think there's an incredible amount of seriousness that settled inside me rather than just going out and like, hey, I'm going to have fun. You know, I'm an actor. I'm going to have fun shooting the show. It's, you know, it's an experience for me. Um, that, that, that week of training put my but on the floor, it, uh, settled me to, um, really what's, what's at stake here and what these guys are, are trying to do. So, um, it was immensely, immensely important. But there was, there were a lot of fun times there too. I mean, we spent I, yeah. a little half a day on the range. I mean, these guys got to shoot weapons that I didn't even get to shoot. I remember they were, they were brought the Tommy gun. <laughs> they they, brought they, they didn't Tommy trust gun. you. That's yeah. the difference. Mark. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had to go through Which the way shoot. Does this go? <laughs> they had to shoot to go through the shoot, don't shoot scenarios with the old fat system, and and they took I, them inside, taught them how to do training uh, raids and clearing rooms. And, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, clearing rooms. We're in those uh, empty rooms and learning how to do that. Felony um, car stops. It was uh, it was pretty intensive. What was the funnest part for you down there, Boyd? That you know, when you got out of it, what's the what what for you? What was the funnest part? I mean, I know you did some serious stuff, but for you, what was fun? I just thought, I mean, these guys are cowboys. Um, you know, they're, they, they are highly trained and, uh, you know, cutting up with guys at that level is, um, it was just, um, as a treat, you know, there's a certain, um, I, you know, just a cowboy attitude to those guys. And, um, I, there's, it just, you only get that out of certain guys. Like I met seals and I've met, and there's just a certain camaraderie to that. And, um, just shooting the shit and hanging out with those guys. That was the best for me. Yeah. We would, I, I think I told you this morning, but we, um, uh, actually all four of us, Boyd, uh, Pedro, Javier and I stayed in a hotel, I think in Stafford's where we were outside the Marine Corps base there. And in the evenings, once class was over, you know, we'd all go back to the hotel and get something to eat and then get cigars and maybe a bottle of wine and go sit outside, and just shoot the breeze and answer their questions and just small talk, getting to know each other a little bit more. And that was uh, 
I've never done that since, you know, and, and, uh, to have the opportunity to sit there with Boyd and Pedro like that. And, you know, we're just, we're small town country boy cops. I mean, you know, get to hang out with these two movie stars, you know, it was, it was a big deal. I got to say. Well, just remember Prestonburg population, 3,681. He started small town. <laughs> I came, my town was 1,500 people. So we're all a little small town from, you know, I'm from Kansas. So yep. we're all that. Hey, well, let's, let's roll forward now. Now you're, you're doing this. Speaking of Spanish. Did you know any Spanish? Did you have to pick it up? Was that part of the training for the job? I mean, how much Spanish did you end up speaking during the series? Um, I'd say a tenth, you know. Um, it was kind of written into the character that this is an, uh, an obstacle for him navigating this world. Um, and for me personally, you know, I, I could end up getting, uh, you know, by or go wherever I needed to go in a cab or something like that in Spanish. Um, that's basically the extent of my Spanish. Um, and it was pretty much, you know, 14 hours a day, six days a week, not nine months straight. There's, there's nothing really else you can do other than just go to work, come home, eat something, crash get up, repeat. Um, so I wish I could have, you know, maybe. Did you, that's what I said with one day off, did you get a chance to go see anything, go, go visit some sites? I mean, you know, eat at some great places, you know, anything like that? Oh yeah. Yeah. We went to, um, uh, we were pretty much stuck in Bogota the whole time, but, uh, yeah, I found my little tribe of people there and we'd all kind of, you know, us actors, we all go out to eat and, and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, the Col- Colombian food and culture is just, it's, it's incredible. Did you ever go eat at Montserrat, the restaurant on top of the hill that you oh, take the oh, cable yeah, car up, up to? There. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I went up there a couple of times. Well, yeah. that's what we all have in common too. We've all ate there too. So, I mean, it, yeah, it's just, it's beautiful. Uh, I remember I was down there, believe it or not, in 2000, Javier and I crossed paths in the embassy because I was working on Plan Colombia. And that's when he came back for his second time, which is kind of portrayed in Narcos. He hung around, but, uh, but yeah, it's just it was it was just so amazing down there. The culture, the people, and even the people in the government. I felt sorry for them because they were outgunned. You know, if you think about it, too, the Narcos had the money, they had the organization, and these people were trying to do what they could. And that was the thing I thought you guys represented well was just showing what the real good people of Colombia look like. Cause they're all not narco traffickers. They're all not bad people. There are a lot of good people in Colombia. They just, you know, mm-hmm. it, literal and figurative sense, they were outgunned. Yeah. I imagine that's what, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people in Mexico are dealing with, with, uh, with the cartels down there. It's, um, you know, it's, you can only kind of do so much and you kind of have to let a little bit of it ride or get out of the way of, mm-hmm. or you're going to get trampled. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I one credit I want to give to you and Pedro with the, the first night I met you guys, I picked you both up at the airport. Uh, we had you, Pedro was, if you remember, Pedro was real late coming in, his flight was delayed. And, uh, so we had you guys come over to the house for dinner and Monica and Mandy, our daughters. So they were, they were still in high school, maybe even middle school. And no, I think they were in high school by this time, but no, I think they're in middle school. Anyway, no, yeah. so you guys came over, and, and unbeknownst to us, the girls had invited all their little friends to come over later that night. And I'm thinking, I told Connie, I'm like, you know, these are Hollywood actors. We don't know these people. I mean, they might be offended that, you know, we're taking liberties with introducing them to all these people. And we were a little nervous when all the kids showed up there, you know, and both of you guys were so gracious. Um, you taking pictures with them, signing autographs, answering their questions. And the, and the little boys were all standing there. and. And it got real quiet for a second. I was standing in the kitchen, if you remember. And I said, boys, it, these are you know who these guys are. This is your one opportunity to ask them questions. And it took about two seconds for one guy to look over at Pedro and goes, hey, in Game of Crimes, how did you squeeze the blood? How did they squeeze the blood out of your eyes when, when the mountain <laughs> killed you? You know, <laughs> I thought, what a question. <laughs> oh, my God. But, uh, well, I mean, but both of you guys were gracious enough to spend time with them and not well, say. Murph, you know but I do want to raise one controversial issue. Pedro kind of had a uh, – reputation like JP, uh-huh. you caught him in bed with your wife. I did. I got photographic <laughs> evidence of that shit too. So you, did you, you know about me, that? I hold it over her head. I remind her of that regularly. Like <laughs> 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 <I> love- <laughs> And muddy waters there. I don't know about that. <laughs> well, we were filming there in the apartment one day in Bogota, that one week that Connie and I and the girls came down and, uh, and 
Pedro was there. He was just sitting on the bed, and Connie was sitting on the other side of the bed. And I said, "Hey, you got to oh. up there. Let me get a picture of you together." So they laid down the bed. I'm like, yeah, "I got you now, girl." Fine. <laughs> I always knew it to be true. Uh, so, had you ever been to Colombia before, Narcos? No, 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 and nope. I'd never been to the South America actually or Central. So let, let's talk about getting into the filming the seasons and stuff. So as you started off, you know, obviously things take a while to get into rhythm, but you start getting rhythm. When do you guys think you hit your stride in terms of working together, the plot coming together? Um, because it's kind of, I think about like Seinfeld, you think about when Seinfeld first started, it was kind of kludgy, but then they, they hit their stride. You started seeing they got a great formula, great chemistry. When do you guys think that happened for you? I would say about a good month into it, you know, Jose's got a very, um, uh, you know, he does a lot of warners. So that means like, um, that instead of doing setups and, you know, coverage of camera here and we cut to this other camera, Warner is just like, it's probably on a steady cam from this guy named Lula, who's his, his DP who has shot all of his previous films. And, um, you know, Scorsese does a lot of those too, where it's basically choreographing movement of the actors all in one shot. So it takes a long time to choreograph it, to, to get it right. Uh, maybe, you know, the blocking is not right or you can't get the line in uh, where the camera is moving. So it takes a long time to, this is about the same amount of time as you do, you know, using a different camera setup and, and blah, blah, blah. But, um, once we kind of figured out that style, um, through basically the first episode after like, you know, getting into the second episode, like we, we kind of found our, our, um, a rhythm there. It was, uh, it was very interesting to, to come down and watch that. You know, the, uh, cause you get like in the apartment scenes and I mean, there's one with you and Joanna and they had the baby there. Um, uh, and when they would film it, it, it wasn't unusual to do several takes because they would move the camera like behind Joanna and then they'd break and then they go move the camera behind Boyd. And it, it was, it was funny, but behind every corner, every door in the closet, there were people hiding. So it looks like there's only three people in the scene, but there's, there might be 15 people in that room. You just don't see them. <laughs> you know, everybody's got to be absolutely quiet. It was, it was, uh, it was kind of cool to see all that. So you were down there for nine months. There's like 10 episodes in one season. So how long does it take? And what's the process for filming just a single episode? It, you know, people think, hey, everything's done sequentially, but it's not always sequentially, right? You're doing things out of order and then they piece it back together later. Yeah. So we, we actually started shooting the uh, episode eight. And I, I believe it was Jose, maybe. They do that a lot now in television. So we'll, the first episode will start we, around where, you know, the, the eighth or seventh episode. So they'll cut into that part and then they'll bring it back to the first episode. And then you'll, you'll build to that that moment that you saw that hooked you in the show and that hook, that hook of narcos season one was um murphy calling in the um or approving the um the the hit there of of these these drug dealers and and these uh, sort of sicario guys and so once you kind of are, are hooked of like this is the main um plot or what we're driving to then it picks up at the introduction and it drives towards that eight, eight, uh, episode and then nine and 10. So I'd say it's about a month at the time. I mean, they probably want to do two, an episode per two weeks, but in reality, it's probably one, w an episode a month. Um, and every show is different, but, um, that's, that's how that one was put together. Cool well, stuff. And there's continuity. You got, I mean, there's certain things around continuity, like, you know, clothing and weapons and stuff like that. But what, what's it like being on set for 14 hours a day? Cause I mean, you think about just being on a regular job, it's like, man, it's a 70 hour work week. And pretty soon you start getting tired. How do you maintain, I mean, from you, like, how do you maintain physically the ability to have the energy and, you know, the brain power to keep doing that stuff day after day? Cause that's, that's, I mean, even after a month, if you're working 14 hour days, Dude, I mean, you, your ass has got to be dragging. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You do all. I mean, I've now I've I've um, I've refined it so well that I, you know, I've, it's a it's a marathon, and how can you get through that marathon? Um, so I can take a nap 
pretty much anywhere. Um, and it's a lot of sitter, sitting around and waiting, you know, like got a, so of, of the 14 hours, uh, you're on set, you're probably working, you know, eight to 10 of those hours. And the other time you're just waiting as they're closing one scene down, they're setting another scene up and you'll rehearse it and they'll, you know, go back and fix lighting. And then you have some time off there. So yeah, you just get really good at time management. A lot of, a lot of, uh, I guess, rookie mistakes are going to craft service and, you know, eating sugar and, you know, muffins and then having and that whatever. crash later. <laughs> and yeah. And then you're like, oh yeah, I can handle this. And then about four o'clock rolls around and you're just dragging ass. Yeah. So you kind of trial and error of a lot. We, I remember seeing down there when, when uh, we came down for that week, they've got a person that walks around with a tray of candy. And you, she, that's her job. She just walks around continuously and you pick candy off that tray if you want it. And then they got a, they've got a coffee barista over there. They'll fix anything you want, you know, from cappuccino, just straight black coffee or latte or whatever. You want. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, you people live a pretty good life here. Oh yeah. I mean, but then the, the, that's the trick. You don't, you don't take any of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I remember, I remember there that, uh, that the first of the week when we came on set, uh, you and Joanne are, they were getting ready for lunch. They were going to break for lunch. And, and, uh, you know, we'd never seen this craft service where it's pretty much anything you want to eat there. And you guys are like, oh, no, no, no. We found a good restaurant. We went a few blocks away, had a good Colombian meal. Um, yep. you know, and, and I can see where I see exactly what you're talking about. Cause the other food was high carbs, high sugar. Yeah. Yeah. You, I, I usually don't eat. Yeah, on any film set, I, I'll, I'll probably just miss dinner. I'll just go and uh, find somewhere to take a nap, you know, and then eat a big breakfast, eat a big dinner. Mm. Hey, well, let's talk too about as you're filming this stuff too. So, you know, my little claim to fame, I was the lead in our junior play, Harvey Elwood P. Dowd, you know, and then I played in uh, the Diary of Anne Frank my senior year. But there's yeah, always the issue Anne of Frank. learning lines. He I was Mr. Anne Von Dom. You know, he's good at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> seeing seeing mystical rabbits that don't appear. <laughs> hey, but how do you go about? So the other thing I'm very interested in, and hopefully other people are, is how do you go about learning your lines? At what point do you? work on those things. How does that work? So like you've got a scene coming up. When does the work for that scene start? How much of it is improv versus, uh, you know, riffing versus, you know, Hey, word for word, you know, follow the script. Uh, well, I, I usually just, you know, I find the accent, find the, um, the vowels, you know, and once you kind of spend a month or so figuring out, okay, well, he says a, instead of a, you know, like there's, it's pretty, you know, microscopic, but you can, you know, it makes the character. And so once you do that, you kind of set it, forget it, which was a good thing for me because at one point, um, there was so much rewriting done on, on Narcos, um, that I just gave up learning the lines. Um, I would, I, because they would change it. I would get the new line. If I had lines the previous night, they were changed on the day. Usually, and uh, I just I just developed a technique where um, over nine months I I can I can you can give me five pages of dialogue and I'll have it memorized in two hours or maybe an hour. Um, it's it's just like a muscle that you kind of train. So the whole memorization, uh, you know, I, I'm pretty sure Pedro did the same thing. We kind of had to, where you just got the pages in the morning where you know they're. Main, they're maintaining that receding hairline that I shaved in. <laughs> and I, See, Murphy's got to keep shaving his hair. It does grow back yeah, like mine. Every morning, shave that receding <laughs> hairline in, take a little bit out the back, and uh, I'd sit there in my in my chair and I would, you know, learn the lines. Um, but, you know, you, you know, the basic uh, 101 fundamentals of acting is like what the scene is about, where the beat changes, and where does the scene start and where does it end? Um, and how, what's your behavior going into that? So if you can kind of keep those things and, you know, you're shooting a scene for three or four hours, um, you know, by that time, you know, you, 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 you have to figure it out. You have to, um, so that, that was the first time for me in my career that I went to work every single day. And there's something, um, so valuable to that because as an actor, you know, say you work on two movies a year 
you're maybe working six months, if that, a year. So for nine months, I got to go to work and figure out, you know, uh, develop a technique to learn my lines, to, you know, do all the the basics. But then if a scene's not working, f- figure it out. Why is it not working? Well, maybe it's because of blocking. So you get that, uh, that training, I guess, or that, that on-site job, you know, uh, involvement that you just can't get anywhere else that you're just like physically trial and error, working it out. Okay. Well, if it doesn't, it didn't work that way. What about if I go over here and we cut that line and we put it to the back and then, Oh, now the scene works just magically works. And so you gotta, you just gotta be able to be confident to, to, uh, to fail in front of people and and to have the, you know, not to be too pretentious, but the courage to, to, you know, figure it out. So between movies and TV shows, like you say, series, was the Hatfield and McCoys, was that a series for you? Which one was like your first series you did? That was, yeah, that was a, a series, uh, s- that was based off of a, a feud that happened in, uh, basically my County Pike County. I grew up in Floyd County, but Pike County. And then was the, uh, McCoys and the Hatfields were on the West Virginia side. And, um, uh, I, you know, I, I knew that that was going to happen and I got involved in that and, uh, you know, believe it or not, that, that was shot in Romania for f- four months because of Roma- in Romania, it's, you know, again, incredibly cool and gorgeous country, but there, you know, in the Carpathian mountains, they were doubling for the Appalachian mountains, you know, they're a hundred years, you know, behind which is incredible. You know, there's people in horse and cart. I don't know what it is like now, but you know, we shot there because there's no telephone poles and there's no nothing. Um, so that was the draw and obviously is probably much cheaper to shoot there. But again, that is, you know, thrown into the deep end and, you know, sink or swim. Hey, players, that is the end of part one. Part two comes out, as always, on Tuesday. In the meantime, go check us out at Game of Crimes on Twitter, at Game of Crimes Podcast on Facebook and the Instagram. Also, go check out our website, GameofCrimesPodcast.com. We've got a lot more information there, including our book list. Any book written by our guests will be listed there. In the meantime, go check us out also, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. It's where we put a lot more content you won't hear on our regular podcast. We go into a lot more topics, and folks, it is a lot of fun. So go check us out, patreon.com slash Game of Crimes. In the meantime, everybody stay safe. We'll see you tomorrow for part two. 